Hello, Jeff Ritchie here, Director of Sponsored Programs at Hamilton College, but also in my spare time, I'm the Chair of the Institutional Review Board. So this video is to help you create your protocol and get it approved on the first attempt. No revisions necessary. Now, one thing to remember, uh, much of the research that we do here at Hamilton falls into the classification of exempt research. This typically means that there's little to no risk to participants and you're not doing anything that is physically invasive. So most of our research can be approved uh, as exempt, simply means it's exempt from full review by the IRB at a scheduled meeting. Now, some things are never exempt and they do require full review and you should know that in advance so you can plan accordingly. Studies involving minors will always go to full board for review. Uh, studies that uh, involve active deception also go to the full board uh, and any study where the participant isn't fully able to consent, perhaps because of a cognitive limitation such as dementia or because they're incarcerated and not completely free to make their own decisions. Uh, but these are the exceptions. Most of the time, you'll be reviewed either by the chair of the IRB, which is me, uh, or the chair and uh, one other designated person. Now that review called limited review only occurs if the subject matter of your research is highly confidential and a breach of confidentiality could be particularly damaging to your participants. So there's a higher level of the psychological and sociological risk. So that being said, let's get started. Okay, so your opening page is pretty self-explanatory. One thing to note is right down here, anticipated start date. Now, while we try to turn around protocols in two weeks or less, protocols that require full board review can take longer. So you really need to plan ahead. In moving on to section 1A, and I should point out right here, anytime, if you feel so inclined that you want to remove the instructions that you see there, the this information is important in weighing the benefits, et cetera, et cetera. If you wanna remove those from your final protocol, you can certainly do that. We don't need them uh, at the IRB either for your benefit. So uh, section A1 um, is, is where, this can be relatively brief. Unless you're conducting research that has a higher than normal level of risk, uh, because this is where you convince the IRB that this project has merit and is worth the risk that participants will experience. So most of the time, this can just be a brief paragraph. Now, section A2 should be somewhat more detailed. Uh, I should be able to read this and fully understand exactly how you're going to conduct your project. Simply saying, participants will fill out a questionnaire does not cut it. Who, what, when, where, how, uh, you know, these are all the questions you need to answer right here. Remember that the point of the IRB is to protect participants and if I can't understand what it is that you're doing, I can't determine if the participants are being protected. So moving along to population, uh, fairly self-explanatory again, most of the time you're going to be checking uh, adults. Uh, you can ignore down there the special minority groups because that really uh, got onto the form some years ago. I don't know why it has no actual legal meaning anywhere. One of these days we'll get it off, but uh, you can ignore that. Uh, institutional affiliation of participants. Again, it's quite often Hamilton, your, your fellow students, so you would check that box. Uh, if you're doing something uh, such as a Mechanical Turk, you would click other and then in specify, put in Mechanical Turk. Uh, B3, pretty obvious, so the number of participants. Uh, <clears throat> B4, how will your participants be contacted? Uh, this is the recruiting for your study. Remember that flyers and the text of your email messages must be provided as an attachment to your protocol. Anything your participants will see, the IRB has to see. Uh, the inducements in B5, typically this is going to be extra credit via SONA, uh, an Opus gift card or, or uh, being entered into a raffle for a gift card uh, or some level of payment off of uh, Mechanical Turk. Now section C is all about risk. It's worth noting here that when we talk about risk, there's what's commonly considered physical risk or psychological risk, and a little more on that in a moment. Uh, there is the risk that one experiences in daily life just walking around being a living human person. Are you physically at risk in daily life? Well, of course, accidents happen. You could get mildly injured. 
Is there emotional risk in daily life? Well, sure. So if the risk from your study is no more than what one would expect in everyday life, that's what you put down, uh, even when the answer is no. If you're asking questions that you believe could act as triggers for some participants and cause them to experience a significant emotional or psychological distress, then you need to explain that as part of your protocol. Now, elevated levels of physical risk are what one would typically encounter when conducting a clinical trial for a new drug. There's the possibility of an adverse reaction or that this drug wouldn't work as well as maybe some other therapy. Now, as a matter of policy here at Hamilton, we don't approve protocols that have an elevated level of physical risk because we don't have medical facilities on site. And frankly, we're not going to allow our students to place themselves in physical danger. So let's get back to the form, shall we? So in section C2, uh, you're going to explain how you're going to mitigate this risk, possibly by assuring the participants that they can pause or quit this study entirely if things get a little too heavy for them. Uh, for uh, studies that have no more than minimal risk, you can simply put in not applicable here. So moving on down to uh, C3 uh, is about deception. Now at Hamilton, our policy has been that there is active and passive deception. Passive deception is when you simply don't fully disclose your research hypothesis to your participants. Why would you do that? Because if the participants knew your hypothesis, that might cause them to answer questions differently. Keeping them a little bit in the dark in that regard is all right, and that is not considered deception. Active deception is where you're going to say yes here, is when you lie to your participants. You tell them, I'm doing this, when in fact you're not doing this at all. Or you provide them with false information and maybe study their reaction. Obviously, you have to deceive them because if they knew the information is false, then you don't get the reaction. Now, protocols with deception get full review. So again, plan your time accordingly. Two things to remember. Deception must be absolutely necessary and you have to justify it. And, and this is very important, you can never deceive your subjects about the level of risk that they are accepting. So C, questions C4 and C5 are kind of all of one piece here. Uh, they're getting back to the psychological and emotional risk. Will there be probing questions or some supplemental materials, maybe visual or auditory, something you're gonna have them look at or listen to that might be upsetting to your participant? Again, these questions and materials have to be provided as an attachment to your protocol. Anything that's going to be provided to your participant must be provided to the IRB. Uh, audio and video materials can be provided via a link to a source online. So that might help you out a little bit there. So section D, scrolling down, is about consent. So um, except in extenuating circumstances, the answer to D1 will always be yes. It may be that you provide the form uh, directly and in person, it may be that you send it to them via email. It may be that you then discuss it with them via Zoom and gain their oral assent. But one way or another, for nearly all research, a consent form is going to be used. So now D2 uh, is about getting parental consent if you're dealing with minors. Remember that parents must consent to the research and the minor child must assent to it. If you're dealing with very young children, this will commonly be done orally because maybe they're not reading yet. Uh, and if you uh, create it, you have to then create a written script for a child level of comprehension, not to beat a dead horse, but that script has to be included with your protocol. So uh, D3 gets at passive versus active deception. If you're planning to use deception, you need to create a script that explains to your participants you know, what it is that you're going to be doing, and that may include some deceptive statements or incomplete statements. But the purpose here is so the IRB can determine whether your deception is active or passive. It also helps to understand the nature of the project. Again, include that script. Uh, D4 doesn't happen very often, but if your research has you only observing group behavior, you need to once again create that script of what you're going to tell the observed participants about your presence among them. 
Uh, section E is about how you're going to protect the confidentiality of your subjects. E1 is uh, sometimes a problem. Will you collect data in a way that could be linked directly back to your participants? Now, most of the time, the answer to this one is yes. A no answer is only appropriate when you're using uh, Qualtrics or some platform that allows for complete anonymity. That is to say, as a researcher, you have no idea who provided you with this data. Anonymous and confidential are not the same thing. Confidential means you know the identity of your participants, but you're keeping their responses in confidence. Uh, section E2 is, is fairly rarely used, but if you're planning to access Hamilton records, you should know that this happens outside of the IRB. We have absolutely no authority to approve access to, to any of Hamilton's records. Uh, let's see, section E3 is uh, who's going to have access to your data. It should be you, your faculty advisor, and most of the time that should be it. Now, regardless of the circumstances of your research, you always want to keep this circle as small as possible. You don't want to have people who don't have a reason to be uh, in your data uh, to be in your data. You should, uh, you know, it helps maintain confidentiality. And then uh, E4 uh, describes how you're going to safely store and ultimately destroy personally identifiable information that you've collected. Now, there are several best practices with regard to data storage, and I'm going to leave that to your professors to walk you through that. But you do need to be specific here, particularly if you're collecting sensitive personal information. So to submit to the IRB, uh, you should have this form filled out the assurance statement, which is the next form right down here, which is a fairly self-explanatory form to fill out, um, your informed consent form, which you can get online, your city certificate, which means you have gone through city training, which you have to do, and all other materials that are being provided to the participant included as an attachment. Now, if there are several questionnaires and scripts and so forth, you may want to label them separately, attachment one, two, three, et cetera. Uh, this is all compiled into a single PDF document, no zip files, no Google Docs, a PDF file. Uh, along with that, you have to submit the IRE, IRB uh, submission summary, and that's a separate Excel spreadsheet. Now, about that informed consent. This is the subject of a good deal of scrutiny by the IRB, so you need, really need to do this correctly. There are several elements that have to be present. The first is your purpose, so you see that right at the top of the page. If you're going to be practicing active or passive deception, this is typically where it begins. Otherwise, you should plainly state to your participant the nature of your research, and it doesn't really have to be much more than, than what you see right there. Uh, the next thing is the procedure. You need to tell your participants what's expected of them, what you're going to have them do, and give them a reasonable approximation of how long it's going to take. I can tell you when I'm reviewing a protocol, I look at section A2, where you describe your research, and I look at the procedure that you have on your informed consent, and they need to match up. The next thing is benefits and risks to participants. Most of the time, that statement that you see right there is probably going to be pretty close. Uh, psychology, sociology, uh, you know, uh, you know we, we're not doing anything uh, in terms of risk to the participant uh, that is, you know, of a physical nature. But if you're going to be providing them with payment via Mechanical Turk or extra credit or being entered into a gift card raffle or something like that, you need to state that there. Also, if you're going to be doing any sort of research where there are potential emotional triggers uh, for your participants, you need to clearly state that there. They need to know this because they can decide for themselves uh, yes or no, you know, as, in terms of whether they want to participate. Uh, the next section, the voluntary nature of the study, rarely, if ever, changes. The language that you see right there uh, is pretty much required by law. So that's going to be there uh, all the time. Uh, contacts and questions, that's going to be you, that's going to be your advisor, and it's going to be me as the chair of the IRB. Uh, and then, you know, they sign below, they date. Remember, uh, I, you know, I said sometimes with this form, 
uh, you might uh, email it. And then if you're doing, say, a Zoom interview or a phone interview, you walk through this form with them. They have one in front of them. They, uh, you have one in front of you. You walk through them. And then at the very end, you say, you know, do you want to participate? And if they verbally tell you yes, then you can sign your name at the bottom with a notation saying, you know, uh, verbal consent provided on thus and such a date. So that is the informed consent. Well, there you have it. Everything that you need to submit a proposal to the IRB. If you have any questions, we're always here to help. You can contact the IRB at iboard at hamilton.edu. Good luck with your research.